Hi, and welcome to Episode 4 of The Savvy Psychologist. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, your host for A Happier, Healthier Mind. I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. We'll use the best of psychology to help you be happy, relaxed, and most importantly, yourself. In today's episode, we'll talk about why most New Year's resolutions fail and how to try again. So now, resolutions. It's late January. Four weeks in, you may be a model of New Year's resolution virtue. Breaking in those running shoes, gamely working through Proust or Joyce, sticking to your budget, or giving the evil eye to the candy bowl on the receptionist's desk. But most of us are back on the couch, watching cat videos on YouTube, or using the new treadmill to dry pantyhose. If you're among the latter, but want to give your New Year's resolution another shot, Here are six tips for a fail-safe resolution 2.0. But first, we need to know what we're dealing with. We can sort resolutions into three categories. Category number one is the result resolution. A result resolution means you're trying to reach a specific goal. Resolutions that fall into this category are things like lose 10 pounds, start a retirement fund, or do my gym's 12-week fitness challenge. You know you have a result resolution if it can be checked off a list when it's done. These are the easiest to stick to because you have a specific goal in mind and you can measure your progress, which is, in and of itself, motivating. Category number two is the habit resolution. This, like practicing yoga or piano, is an ongoing process and never really finishes. There may not be a true end goal, but the satisfaction is in the progression itself. The difficulty in keeping a habit resolution is front-loaded because it does take substantial effort and patience to set up a new system, remember to do it, and tweak it until it works. The bright side is that once the habit is changed, it runs itself. For example, how often do you think about brushing your teeth or putting on a seatbelt? Right, because these are well-established habits. Once your new habit is integrated into your routine, you can reap the results without much effort or stress. Resolutions from this bucket include sleep at least seven hours a night, go vegetarian, or read more books. Category number three is the holistic resolution. This is a broad, whole-person resolution, such as be a better person, be happier, or take more risks. The holistic resolution, despite its loftiness, is often the first to be cast aside. The reason lies in its vagueness. A resolution that can't be defined, much less measured, can't be achieved. A final bonus genre is the cessation resolution, which is trying to stop doing something. A cessation resolution can fall under any of the first three categories. It can be a result resolution like quit smoking, a habit resolution like stop wasting time on Facebook when I'm supposed to be working, or a holistic resolution like stop being cheap. The challenge with a cessation resolution is that it can be difficult to feel motivated and energized about not doing something. Plus, it's hard to track the progress of a non-event. But once you know what sort of resolution you have, here's how to modify it to maximize your chances of success. Soon, you'll be sticking to your resolution like gum in a preschooler's hair. So tip number one is be specific, very specific. Transform holistic resolutions into result resolutions. A 2013 study from the University of Liverpool found that people with clinical depression were more likely to set vague, undefined goals. Having a vague goal made it more difficult to achieve the goal, therefore creating a downward spiral of perceived failure which could reinforce the depression. By contrast, the researchers noted, setting a specific goal could help break the cycle. Of course, you don't have to be depressed to reap the rewards of a specific resolution. In a real-life example, a lovely yet lonely patient of mine we'll call Elizabeth came in with a resolution of be more social. I applauded her idea and then we worked on transforming her holistic resolution into a result resolution so she could measure her progress and know if she had achieved her goal. So she turned Be More Social into goals to join the local tennis club, volunteer as a stagehand for a community theater, and organize a reunion of her three best friends from college. Other examples might include transforming something like save money into deposit $100 a month into a retirement fund, or turn something like be a better person into volunteer at the animal shelter every other week. Tip number two, the fresh start effect. 
Another way of making it easy to get back on the wagon is to consider not only January 1st as the starting line, but other natural beginnings throughout the year. A brand new study out of Wharton and Harvard Business School suggests that people tend to start and restart goals in relation to meaningful points in time, like New Year's Day, but also birthdays, holidays, a new semester, and even the beginning of the week. The researchers demonstrated that both Google searches for the term diet and actual in-person gym visits all peak at the beginning of the week, month, year, and holidays, and then taper off. The researchers named this phenomenon the fresh start effect. So starting your diet on Monday may be cliche, but restarting it every Monday is smart. Give yourself permission to have many starting points this year, and your resolution will stand the test of time. Tip number three, be modest. Small goals are more likely to be achieved, so go easy on yourself. Small changes, done consistently, add up over time. For example, walking for 10 minutes a day seems like nothing, but it adds up to five hours of walking over the course of a month. If you have a really big goal, like losing 50 pounds, break it up into mini goals like losing five pounds a month. Looking at it in increments makes it more attainable and less overwhelming. Plus, do the math, and by the end of the year, you may have lost 60. Tip number four, allow waves especially for a habit resolution, beware the mistake of expecting immediate perfection. The aspiring vegetarian, for example, could look at her first bacon-induced slip as either a temporary setback or a total failure. Gently framing it as a minor setback makes it easier to get back on the wagon. Tip number five, tweak it until you're excited. Particularly for a cessation or a habit resolution, if it feels like drudgery, you're probably not going to do it. There are enough aversive things we make ourselves do, whether it's floss, eat salads, or scoop the kitty litter. The last thing we need is another task to slog through. But if we look forward to tinkering with our new budget app, going to Zumba with two close friends, or heading to the farmer's market for the week's fresh veggies, a virtuous task becomes a pleasure, and, all of a sudden, much more likely. Tip number six. For a cessation resolution, reward yourself. Again, it's hard to get psyched about resisting temptation. So to add some incentive, consider rewarding yourself. You could do this in terms of time, like giving yourself a small reward every day, or a bigger reward each week, or even a tiny reward every few hours if you're tackling something really hard, like quitting smoking. Alternatively, if you're trying to stop purchasing something, like cigarettes or twice-daily Starbucks, set aside the money you'd spend, and when it's accumulated, spend it on a weekend getaway, a night on the town, or for the truly virtuous, an investment. So there we have it. To sum up, mix specificity, a pleasant, sustainable system, and a little forgiveness, and you'll have a bulletproof plan to stick to your resolution. It may be so easy, you won't even wait till 2015 to tackle your next resolution. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson. I love to hear from listeners, so please keep in touch on the Savvy Psychologist Facebook page or on Google+. A transcript of the podcast and references for the studies I mention are always available on quickanddirtytips.com. That's all for this week. A final note, remember that the Savvy Psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and doesn't substitute for psychiatric care or psychotherapy by a licensed professional. So always seek a licensed physician or psychologist in your area for all mental health-related treatment and questions. As always, all patient names have been changed and details altered to protect privacy. Thanks for listening, and see you next week for a happier, healthier mind.